Hello, thank you for joining. My name is Chris Lindsay. I wrote software for over 30 years, ran an application security program for three years at a large company, and now I manage professional services in North America for MEND. Let's talk about top tactics for application security innovation today. I have only 45 minutes to talk today, so I came up with a small list of topics that spans multiple areas. It's intended to get you thinking about the different areas of an application security program. Knowing where to start is half the battle. Today, we are going to discuss, find out what you don't know, educate from the top down, bake application security into your developer onboarding, show, don't tell, attack your software and build bridges with champions. Find out what you don't know. How many of the following of you guys could you answer for your entire enterprise? For example, what applications are used within your enterprise? What applications have you guys written that are actually utilized? For example, you might have microservices, you might have Windows services or things running on Linux. Where are your applications used? What languages does your application use? What is within your environment? Are you looking at Java? Are you looking at .NET? Are you looking at .NET Core or Framework? Are you looking at any of the JavaScript frameworks that are out there? What languages do your applications use? How do your applications communicate internally and externally? You know, do you understand that your applications are reaching out to the world? Are they secure? Are they encrypted sending the data across the wire? Or internally, are you just running unencrypted in your network? What if your network is compromised? Do you know how your applications communicate? They could be email, FTP, APIs. Where are your authentication details stored? Are you storing your authentication in a database? Active Directory, Okta? If you're actually saving your authentication information in a database, are you storing your credentials securely? Are they hashed? Are you using a good secure hash? There's a lot of ways to secure information in a database. Are you doing those? Do you store credit card information? For example, do you store the credit card number or do you store some of the information? But if you're storing some of the information, are you storing information that could be critical in case of a breach. For example, the PIN number on the back of a card or the expiration date. Are you just saving the last four digits? What are you saving uh, related to credit card information? There's a lot of questions when you start looking at what you have in your software, what your software is doing. The big question is in your security program, do you understand what you have in your environment? Because what you don't know is potentially where you're gonna have trouble. Educate from the top down. Application security needs to be integrated across the ent uh, entirety of a development program. Everyone plays a role. Everyone from the C-suite all the way down to the developers. QA plays a major role as they are the gatekeepers to help ensure that only secure code makes it to production. When everyone is on board, your program will be successful. Here are some ideas. Communicate with the C-suite. Make sure that the CEO, CIO, all the way from the top down, understand what is the security program that you guys are running for your company. If they understand what you're doing, and the tools that you're using, it will make it easier for you to procure the tools that you need. If there are any gaps, the C-suite, let them know because security in today's environment in today's world is very, very crucial. There are tools today in the last two years that have come out that will really pretty much simplify hacking. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Yearly company-wide meetings to help share security program with your developer community. Previously, at, at, at a previous role I had, I would get in front of the entire development community and discuss 
what tools do we use? How do you use the tools? You know, making sure that everybody is, is understanding what we're doing and why we're trying to do things. Because if they understand what you're trying to achieve and how you're trying to achieve it, they're going to work with you. So sharing that information company-wide can be very, very helpful to get your point across and to build a relationship with the developer community. The last thing you want to do is have a situation where the security team and the development team do not work together. And when you have that happen, nobody wins. The developers ignore the security tools. The security guys are frustrated because, hey, we have these vulnerabilities. How do we solve them? And the developers are like, hands up, I'm not going to help. So building a good relationship between the developers and security is crucial. One of, and I'm going to share a couple ideas as we go through these. One of the ideas that I did at a previous uh, position, APIs. Every application in today's world within probably 90 to 95% of all applications use API. So my question to you is, are your APIs secure? Do you have good practices around your API from a security standpoint as well as a developer standpoint? Something that you might consider getting software architects from the development team together with the security team. Put together a document that says for APIs, here is the coding best practices from a, from a developer standpoint. You know, how it should look, how it should run, how it should act. From a security side, are they secure? Are you using tokens like JWT tokens? Do they have good expiration dates? Are they expiring within a reasonable time? Are they you know, expiring in minutes or hours or days? If you're looking at hours or days, you might reconsider uh, because that's just a little too long. So you know, building an API best practice document between the different uh, groups, the security and the application, will bring you guys together where you can put in your, hey, here's the security thing. Another example on the API, and then I'll move on. Logging in. If you try to do a login and you fail, are you going to return back a, I'm sorry, invalid password, try again? Or are you going to return back a, I'm sorry, invalid username or password? Because now a bad actor you know, will realize this username is not right or this password's not right. So you know, giving them the information to, hey, this piece isn't right is not a good practice. A good practice would be, I'm sorry, invalid credentials entered, please try again, or, or something along those lines. Monthly reports to the executives. Keeping the executives, going back to the communication with the C-suite, monthly reports to the executives is very important. The reason why is because keeping the executives in the loop, where you stand with the program today is very crucial. The reason for that is because if you have a team or teams that are struggling to put resources together to, to resolve uh, security issues, these reports can help that. For example, in development during my 30 years, you know, the biggest thing your developers are trying to do is get a new feature out the door or fix a bug that they have with their system. Security is typically felt as do we really need to do this? Yeah, we understand that we need to do this, but the reality is we've got to get this other stuff out the door. And how many times when you, as a security team, how many times has the developer manager or somebody from the development side come to you and said, hey, I'm sorry, we've got to get this out the door. Can I get a pass on these security items? What's the CISO to do? We got to get stuff out the door. We got to do the security stuff. What can you do? One thing you can do in a situation like that is make sure that when you have your application security tools scanning, that they can scan in conjunction along with your builds, along with other things that, that are happening during the process. You know, moving everything completely to the left and the right, having a dual approach. Another good example that will bring you into this is think about a repository integration. Every time that somebody commits something to the repository, you've kicked off your, your, your security tool scans. That way, 
during the build process, your scans are already running. They're already running in conjunction with the build process. Typically, when, when you do this and you get to QA, you know the results. Hopefully you would know the results before QA. One thing that you can do is with some of the software, and this was something that, that I pushed at my previous place, make sure that when you go to a senior tech review, that's where your developers will come to their senior developers and review the source code, make sure that you know the features are correct, that there are no bugs, that everything looks good, and then look at the source code to see, is the code clean? Does the source code follow company standard practices? You know, if a developer were to leave and somebody else come in, could they understand what you have as far as from a development standpoint? You know, is it readable? Does it follow the company standards? Again, back to that API thing. So during this process, during your senior tech review, it could be very crucial to say, did we look at the security measures that are in place? Do we understand that you just created an API? That question, if you have two active users, can I share one token with the other account or the other user and see their data? The answer better be no, if you're a multi-tenant system. If it's yes, then please, after this webinar, go back to your team or go back to you know, your development manager and create a ticket to fix that, because that is how data can leak out of a company. Monthly newsletters to developers. Again, going back to the API, one of the things that I did was I focused for a year on different topics, one of which was API. There is a great website called apisecurity.io that talks about breaches and problems that have happened related to APIs you'll find the big guys all the way down to teeny tiny companies who have had problems with data leakage or you know they did not properly verify their tokens or you know SQL injections all this other stuff that could happen within APIs remember with APIs APIs are not just limited to websites APIs are hey I have a mobile phone I need to be able to access this information within my application uses APIs to get that data APIs also play a role with, you know, business to business communications. You might have an API where your end users will log in and pull data, you know, raw data or, or different data for their needs. So understanding that your APIs are locked down and secure are important. And that website that I mentioned with that, with, you know, building your newsletter, put examples in there because everybody that's developing as human and make mistakes. And again, it's one of those things where learn from others where they have tripped up or where they've had mistakes and, and try to be better because of that. You know, try not to actually be that company that had the breach or, or the problem that, that comes into it. Bake application security uh, into developer onboarding. Think about the different security tools. You know, what tools and strategies you know, enable you to achieve this? So you know, start your security training out of the gate. Day number one, employee comes in, you know, bigger companies have an onboarding day, smaller, you might walk in and you might have a few minutes with a development manager and, and then get, uh, here's your desk, here's your computer, here's what you need now. You know, here's the repositories, the source code, and, and, and get started. Or it could be more than just a developer. It could be a manager. So, you know, look at starting your security training out of the gate. If you have an HR program where you're sitting down on day one and, and you're talking about what the company does, have somebody come in and spend 45 minutes to an hour from the security team talking with everybody. They don't have to be developers because... Talking about your security program, what tools you're using, going back to, you know, getting in front of the company, do a smaller version of that, or at least have a recording at, at the minimum that you can share and say, hey, you know, day one, day two, you know, at least the first week, you know, run through these. Or again, if, if possible in person, have somebody from the security team come in and talk about what you guys do and, and how you do it and how you approach things. That way your developers, when they go in and sit down and start working, they know this information 
and and you've really kind of started them on on the right foot. Ensure that your developers do feel comfortable talking with the security team. Again, many customers that I talk to in, in my role today, I ask the question, how is the relationship with your development community? I get a wide variety of answers. I have a, you know, it's 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 a, you know, I don't like them, they don't like me. You know, security doesn't understand. Security is always pushing, they're always saying no, 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 no. You know, they they just do not want to, you know, let our application go out the door. The security guys are like, look, I'm just asking for things to get done. I, I really would like for you to, you know, focus on this one or or focus on that one. And and really there's a big disconnect between your developers and security because in some cases you have a security team that were previously developers. This is ideal. Having a developer that moved over to security that really understands, lives, breathes, and gets it can work with your development community to help ensure a successful program. But if you don't have that relationship, you guys are going to be talking apples to oranges. The developers are trying to get something out the door and, and feel like you're just shoving security down their throat. The security guys are like, why aren't they listening? You just, you have the budding of heads. And so finding a way to, you know, getting a comfortable relationship between your security team and the developers is, is critical. That API suggestion that I had before worked wonders. We had software architects from multiple teams that had never met each other, that after, the, after we were done with that API best practice document, they got together, we created a, a Teams chat group, and the different architects started reaching out to each other. Did you use this tool? What kind of issues did you run into? Or, hey, we're seeing this. What do you think about that? That community was built and it tore down the walls. Think about and understand, make sure your developers understand the tools that you're using. One big thing that, that I run, in, run into frequently is, you know, I'm not going to listen to the security team because they're shoving the stuff down my throat and they're all false positives. Are they false positives? Are they really, truly a false positive? Make sure, and, and we're going to hit another slide here in a minute that, that we're going to dig in a little bit more, but think about the tools that you're using. Make sure that the developers understand we're using a SAST tool. And the SAST tool brings the ability to scan source code looking for vulnerabilities. It's looping through your code. It, it's looking for SQL injection or command side, you know, exe you know, command executions and you know, just a variety of cross-site scripting issues. You know, some issues are definitely much more critical than others. You know, you might have where, where your SAS tool is flagging, you know, hey, I found a password in your source code. It's in the web.config file or app.config file. Well, that's typical in a development environment. And is that where you're scanning? Because 99% of the time you are scanning your development code. So is that a false positive? No, but do we really need to be worried about it? No, unless somebody has access to get in and actually see through the tool and look at the data. So, you know, again, you know, everything that I taught, the highs really for a SAS program with, with the tooling that we used, you know, focus on the highs, make sure that the highs are true issues and, and try to remediate those. When you start, and remediation doesn't mean a developer has to go change the code. Remediation might be in the form of modifying your load balancer, your F5, you know, having some web application firewall sit in front looking for SQL injections. So you may have an application that's got a lot of issues in a security, uh, in the security mind that you might be able to remediate through other, uh, other means. So when you're looking from a security standpoint at these are the issues we have, don't be just so focused on the tools. Make sure that you think about the other things that are outside outside of it. You know, DAST. You know, SAS could take, you know, depending on the application side, size, minutes to hours. You know, DAST, you know, dynamic application security testing. When you start looking at DAST, that is an automation that you point to in a, a web app. 
and that can then go out and start attacking it. It will go in and it will change parameters. It will go out and do a lot of things behind the scenes trying to break your application. And when it does, most DAS systems will actually record all that information for you so that you could go back and look at it. You could go back and understand what did it attempt? What was the result? Here's the raw data so that you could go in and, and make a um, make a decision. Hey, is this something that we need to address? Yeah, once you start moving into DAST and, and SCA and IAST and, and pen testing, your, your result quality is going to start increasing dramatically. Let's talk about software composite analysis or SCA. The reason why that is extremely important is because you're utilizing somebody else's source code. You're using third party open source or a third party company. When you start looking at open source tools, are you thinking about licensing? Are you thinking about the fact that, you know, this is has a license that could get us financially in trouble in the future? Or there's some GPL licenses that require you to open source your own license or your own tools. So understanding the licensing model behind some of the open source tools are critical. Or what vulnerabilities are, are we looking at? You might have an application, and, and by this point, everybody knows Log4j, but I'm going to go ahead and just use that because it's a great example. When you look at Log4j, you could easily take over a server just by a couple of keywords, very short amount of text, and you can actually be in on the server. And so with Log4j, understanding what you have in your environment, going back to that inventory at the beginning, understanding where things are, hey, we have a zero day. What is the impact? Oh, we could get compromised east to west within our network because of this open source tool. And so knowing that that exists within your environment, which is the inventory stuff that we talked earlier, and understanding the vulnerabilities that are related to that from an SCA tool will help you to better understand, is this, a, is this something that we need to remediate? Again, your remediation might be we're going to do something on the front end versus fixing the source code today. Because on a zero day, you might be in a situation where you have code on on prem and at the customer sites. And if you're in that kind of position, that could mean that trying to help your customers or trying to get out something out the door could be very hard. And you might have multiple versions. I mean, now we start talking about a tree. So understanding shifting to the left understanding during your development, hey, here are my vulnerabilities. Here are the issues that I have. You can fix them. Once you get to production, it's a whole different story. And so understanding what you have as far as you know the abilities is, is important. I asked even stronger. I asked is, is a hit and miss. There are some vendors that do a really great job at I asked, and then there are other vendors that, that simply do not. I asked, we'll look at the traffic coming in live and be able to come back and say, I just identified a, sec uh, a security vulnerability. When you start seeing things like that, red flags should be coming up and those should be at the top of your development stack, including again, like SCA and, 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 and DAST. Again, they have a, a lower false positive rate. So, okay, let me uh, move on to the next one. Okay. Show, don't tell. Okay. Why is security important? You know, create a presentation where you go out and attack your internal software. So security teams, if I pick up the phone and I reach out to a development team and say, hey, you've got a problem. Great. What do I have? Oh, you've got a command injection. Oh, well, where? Um, on your login. Okay. Now what? So don't just, from a security standpoint, we are going to talk about pen testing on the next page, but let me hit this just real quick. If you're doing pen testing, if you're doing anything like the DAS, share the information over with the different development teams. And if you can, record it. Record your attack. Record the process happening. Because if you do that, now you're actually doing a few things. You're building a library for yourself. Hey, developers. You want to see what cross-site script looks like? Here you go. Or command injection or, or some of the other ones, SQL injection. Hey, look, I'm stealing data. You don't have it. You're not logging it on the back end 
I'm doing it through your API, showing and 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 making that impact is 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 very 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 critical. Another one, you know, go out and and take your build, go out and install it on another machine, and then go try to decompile it. One of the tactics that I used when I was looking at vendors, I would take their applications and I would try to decompile them. The reason why is because if they're not looking at the small things, what about the bigger things? So making sure that you are obfuscating your source code so that nobody can decompile it is, is very, very important. Think about SolarWinds. How did the Russians know where to go in and implant the issue? You know, their, their code. You know, how did they know that they could do certain things and get away with it. Well, it, it's really quite simple. If you release software out to the world and somebody goes and decompiles it, you're going to have their source code. And you may be able to decompile it and actually go you know, recompile it yourself and have your own version. When you start doing things like that, a lot of great things happen. You can bypass licenses, you can bypass things. You can change their code. You have a source, copy of their source code. Why am I bringing this up? And this is, you know, probably shouldn't be, but, you know, when you start looking at your development life cycle, you know, your development life cycle at the very end should take security into consideration. And this is just one of the many pieces, you know, making sure that you are following good practices, you're obfuscating your code. That way, nobody can go in and take your intellectual property and, and, and do, the, you know, have their own way with it. Very, very, very critical to uh, to make sure you do that. So you know, showing and 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 you know, don't just tell a group that you have they have an issue, but show them. And again, that kind of goes back to help that developer uh, in the security relationship because when that relationship's there, you can pick up the phone and say, "Hey, I just noticed this. Do you have a few minutes?" Yes, I do. And 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 build and, and grow from there. Um, all right, take a quick drink. All right, attack your own software. Pen testing is critical to ensuring secure software. Let me give you an idea. Go out and get an intern for the summer. Go into your security tools and take the most critical type items that, that you can find in your reports. Command injections. I know I keep talking about command injections or SQL or, or pick on a multitude of issues. If your application's nice and clean and secure and you have a good clean pen test, good for you. But a lot of applications do not have a good pen test. Think about it this way. You can go out and reach out to a third party and have them pen test your application. That's black box. They don't have access to the source code. They don't have access to all the details and the data. And so when you do pen testing with a third party, they're going to come in and they're going to blindly start attacking you. But guess what? Your interns, your security team, if you have a developer that understands what they're looking at, can take a look at the source code, can take a look at things, and then go out and try to attack it. Now they have the ability to go in and see, hey, I'm starting to see something maybe I should go in and, and, and try to dig a little bit deeper and, and see what I can what I can find. Because when you're doing pen testing and you find something as simple as, you know, my, my security headers are, are being flagged in these and, and who cares about security headers? Well, if, if, a, if somebody is looking at your site, trying to break in or yourself and you find anything Hey, guess what? Security headers weren't set. Oh, if they're not setting security headers or they're not locking things down, what else did they not lock down? So think about it from that way. If you're going to be out there releasing source code or not source code, applications on the web, and you're not doing these extra little measures, which a lot of them can actually be remediated through your front end, through your F5s. They don't have to be remediated within source code. Or your I I R or your web server, you know, bit Tomcat or or IIS or however you're hosting your 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 site. You know, these little things is what hackers are looking for. And just so you guys are aware, I'm sure you are, but if you're not, there are companies that are out there consistently scanning every single IP address. 
And then they're coming back and they're saving that information and they're making it where it's on a search engine that you could go up and, and look at. So if you think that nobody's looking, you're wrong. Using a tool like Burp Suite for pen testing is excellent. Back to the SCA thing. The reason why it's important to have SCA within your environment, source code, our, our software composite analysis, is making sure that somebody with Burp doesn't just hit your site and get your details. Because with Burp Suite, there's a plugin that will show you, here are the open source tools they're using. Here are their versions. Here's the vulnerabilities related to each of those. And here's how to go attack it. So if you're not doing anything like this internally, the hackers already have this information. They're better, well, they're better equipped than you are. So think about it that way. You know, again, knowing what you don't know is a problem. So don't limit yourself on your pen testing. As you're going through and you're doing your pen testing, go for it. Make sure you're in an environment that is not production. You could hit a UAT, but make sure that the different internal teams know that this is what you're about to do or what you're actually doing. That way, if there are security alerts and monitoring in place, you're going to trip those. Hey, guess what? If you're tripping those, that's excellent. As an attacker, find a way to not trip those. Because if you can find a way to get in and do things that do not trip the wire or trip the security alerts, share that information with the networking team or the other teams that are related to that so that something could be put together to help ensure that you are able to do it, but the next guy can't. So again, when you're limiting, uh, when you're limiting yourself to pen testing and, and putting limits on what you're trying to do, it's like a developer trying to do QA. You're going to go through the happy path. Oh, we're good. No, you see anything. Hey, this looks like a SQL injection. How far can I take this? Can I go in and actually execute a command shell straight from your database? Guess what? That's possible. And so making sure that you don't just stop, you know, dig, 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 dig. A good pen test could take a couple of weeks to a month internally, possibly longer, depending on the size of your application. It could also mean that you know, you have your DAS running, your DAS is good for the low hanging fruit, and you can use that information to help feed your pen test to make sure that you're going deeper. When you're looking at external third party tools and companies for pen testing, make sure that you, you do kind of a, a two sided way. Black box, what can they find? What can they do without any help or intervention from you? Because being able to attack you black box style is important for you to know because that is typically without information what they can do. And then give them and feed them some information. For example, all your pages. You know, give them the sitemap. So if they can't produce a sitemap, give them a sitemap because there could be areas that maybe they are limited because of their account levels. Make sure that you give them a user and administration and, and different layers, levels to go off of. Again, if you see something, go after it. All right, let's talk about building bridges with uh, security champions. Security champions are a great extension of the security program. So how many people are in your security program today? Are you talking one, two, three, or are you talking 20? The big question becomes when you're a smaller shop or even your bigger shops, and you don't have that many security uh, professionals in your team, can you really keep your ear to the ground? Can you really understand what's happening within your company? Do you understand that this little niche group that's producing this little microservice that is nothing more than say 2000 lines long of source code could be the reason why you get breached? Getting a, a group of developers together, building a security champion uh, program where you bring them in, you bring in some of the the, the uh, developers who are very interested in security, who volunteer, hey, I'd love to do this. Because telling somebody you're now a security champion and, and you know, for someone who is not very security minded is not a great idea. Make sure that your security champions are ones who want to volunteer, who really have an interest in this. Also, make sure that you're not picking on the guy who is, you know, working 60 hour weeks and, and trying to get, you know, who's doing 40% of your development work by himself. 
he's a great resource, but when you start looking at what impact that you have, make sure that you're working alongside with this guy to ensure that you have security being followed by him. But again, having a security champion in the different teams is very important because now you have eyes and ears on the ground. They can look at what's going on. They can attend the, the uh, uh, senior tech reviews. They can attend and, and understand the scrums. What's going on? What features are, are being done? And if you're a smaller company or you have tons of, uh, tons of different teams, you might take a champion, a developer, and just make them security only, where they're just kind of kind of a dotted line to the security team, but they're still kind of in the development arena where they can you know, oversee multiple things. Or they might be a 50-50 split. 50% 50 of their time is focused on security. The other 50% of the time is focused on development because we don't have the resources to go out and just hire people to, to look at security. They can be out there to make sure that as the security team is coming out with ideas, hey, we would like to, you know, make sure that all the teams are are focused on this type of security. You know, maybe it's, you know, Security Awareness Month, and we're going to focus this week or this month on a certain aspect, APIs, or we're going to focus on, you know, knocking out cross-site script injections. You know, a good question: What's the difference between a cross-site script injection and a stored cross-site script injection? A lot of people don't understand the difference. A lot of them do where, where you can understand, well, stored, yeah, there. But what does it mean for a website? What does it mean logging into a back end and saving something with, with an injection and then seeing it on the front end? Again, these are things that from a security standpoint, you can teach your champions and they can take that down to the developer level. And now you may have 4,000 developers working for you with a couple, maybe a hundred security champions, or maybe even 20 or 30, but you can share that information with them and they can get it out. You may have, you may be an international company where you have people overseas in India, in Germany, in, in France, all over the globe. And by having security champions, you have somebody that's on site that understands the language that can relay that information in, in a very good, uh, positive way. So, you know, a good security program will relay important information back to the development community and vice versa. And, and from there, you may actually be able to know what's going on with, with the different development teams. And so, you know, understanding, you know, the whole atmosphere is, is very critical. At this point, I am... I got a little done a little faster. I'm used to doing these and I'm usually right at 45 minutes. Are there any questions that we have? Ah, one just came in. Okay, so I had mentioned the tools have really made a change in the last two years. Today, developers can, or anybody could really for that matter, go out and download free tools and start hacking and attacking. There's lots of great resources. You could go out to Pluralsight. You could go out, um, K-State has a, a cybersecurity certificate program. And so the tools in the last two years have really come a long way. Look at Burp Suite, for instance. Some of those plugins are amazing. They do a lot of automation. They will sit there and try to bypass a web application firewall all automatically. And so, when you start looking at what have you done with your program in the last two years, are you keeping up with the changes? Again, the changes in the last two years have been very, very dramatic. They have automated a lot of just the simple things. Things that used to be low-hanging fruit are, are givens, are gimmies. You have other things now that you start have to start looking at. For example, there are tools out there that if it finds a SQL injection, will actually build a schema of what your database looks like and could even take that information out. Not trying to scare you, but those tools do exist and they're free. And that is where the, the you know, where the rub is. So from a security standpoint, what are you doing? Does your application security team work with your network security team? Are you guys meeting? Do you have uh, playbooks that you guys go off of? For example, if something were to happen or we were to notice something you have a playbook for even the simplest things. You know, don't go too crazy, but go something bigger than just an Excel spreadsheet that says, hey, 
in the event I see this, go do this, this, and this. But no, a little bit bigger. Hey, in the event that we see you know, potential data leakage, what do we do? What are the steps? Who do we notify within our company? Um, absolutely important. All right. Uh, any other questions? Ah, uh, yes. If you have a developer on your team, looking at tool APIs is very important. The question is, you know, should we use APIs to go beyond just typical report uh, details? And the answer is yes. Taking APIs and automating this within your program could be extremely helpful. Think about it this way. When you have the ability to go in and pull your user data, your usage data, what information has been done, you know, again, your reports, but a lot of applications do give you the ability to do a lot of automation. For example, when you do an onboarding of a new developer or a new associate within your company, you could go out and have the different applications that you use for onboarding go out and automatically create, hey, create their account. Here's their email address. Give them this level access. Oh, they're part of this team. Go out and do X, Y, and Z. So with your automation, you can get to the point where you can onboard. For example, if your company does a lot of mergers and acquisitions, you can get down to the point where it's only four hours or less to onboard your new acquisition. You think, oh, that's crazy. I was actually doing that with, with the program that I had. Any onboarding of a new company could be done within less than four hours. A couple database entries, a couple things, and off to the races you are. So think about the APIs in all of your applications. Don't just focus on one, but look at your whole application set and ask, what can I do uh, to automate this to make it easier? As you do your automation, that lessens the load on the security team. So there, there's a lot of flexibility. Okay, I had the two questions. Any other questions? Okay. All right, uh, please feel free to contact us with any questions that you ha might have after this, and I will do my best to answer them. Uh, if you wish to schedule a demo of our software, we, we are in the SCA and SAST market. Uh, you will find the details listed in the attachment section. Thank you again for watching today, and please remember to download a copy of my paper located in the attachment section. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you.